So what can we say about Ruth? I'd just like to do just a little bit of uh, an introduction because I think before you, although you may not think it to look at her, we have one of Gold Hill's elite athletes. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so we watch the Olympics. We know that life uh, is a marathon, not a sprint. Uh, but Ruth was born uh, in Egypt to missionary parents in 1931. And we've got 30 minutes to talk about her life. Now, you'll notice, uh, I know a gentleman shouldn't ask a lady her age, and you'll notice that I haven't, because I haven't told you when, in 1931, she was born. Uh, you do, it not, it yeah, not. Yeah, yeah you, you do the maths. But effectively, we've got 20 seconds uh, per year. So we've got 30 minutes. Uh, Ruth, I'd just like to then ask you the first question. Um, I said you were born of missionary parents, so you learnt about Jesus from your parents. Uh, but what was it that brought you to your own faith? Okay, well, starting then at the beginning, yes, my mother particularly took time with me as a small child, morning after morning, to tell me stories of Jesus, to have her Bible there, and to teach me to pray. And those are the foundations of my life. And everything after that is built on those solid foundations. So I would say to any mums or grandmas here, it's well worth it. Take time to tell your children about Jesus and how he loves them and how he came for them and will always be for them. And also, my mother was a great one for singing hymns. And then she, would, uh, she had an organ, and so she would sit at the organ playing hymns and singing, and she would bring me up to sit beside her. So, of course, I learned hymns, all kinds of hymns, not children's hymns, but children's, uh, but hymns like Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah, Pilgrim Through This Barren Land. Ah, that was a clue. It was a barren land. Egypt is a barren land in so many ways. And where my parents lived was in a town that was totally Arab and Muslim. And we were right in the middle of that. And we learned to praise God right there. He loves me. And then there was a bit of a shock because um, by the time I was about six and I had to leave my lovely home and go away to Cairo because he said I needed education. And uh, didn't want education, but I had to go. <laughs> and I had to stay with other people that I didn't know in Cairo, and they would look after me so I could go to school, an English school, because there weren't any where we lived. So that happened, and it went on from being about six. When I was about 12, quite an incident came. I was on holiday, and at that time, Egypt was a base for a lot of British soldiers. And uh, they got to know the Christian homes, some of them who were Christians, and there were a lot, and they would come and visit us. And a man came to visit my parents, and he told them a sad story about how he'd been in a Christian home, and then he'd gone in with bad friends, and he'd got into a lot of trouble, and he was actually in prison, in the army prison. And then he had finished his, and he'd come to see my dad to ask him to help us. And uh, I heard this story, and I thought, Corks, is my faith, my parents' faith, do I need to grab it for myself? So at that day, I prayed 
I prayed, Lord, I knew he was my love. He, he loved me. I knew he saved me. But I wanted him to be more than that. I said, Lord, I need you to be my master. Who knows what I'll get into? So be my master. And you know, that very evening, another soldier came, and he had come from Israel, and he brought me a book, a Bible, a Bible with uh, wood, wooden, uh, you know, olive wood, olive wood backy. And it was on the very day when I had prayed that God would be my master. And I wrote in, in my Bible, on the day I received this Bible, I gave myself to Jesus, 1944. Never have I lost this Bible. I don't know how and why. I lost most other things. <laughs> but this one, this one has stayed with me through sick and thin. So, I knew, sealed with a loving gift, Jesus is mine. Hallelujah. Yeah, does that answer? Yes. It's a very good answer. Thank you very much. Um, so, uh, you became a missionary uh, in Zambia for 10 years between 1957 and 1967. Could you just tell us a little bit about that time? So, why Zambia? Um, and what did that teach you about God's calling, um, his protection, his provision? Uh, uh, just more about that time generally. Okay, all of those things, yes. So why Zambia? I, I grew up, we came back to England, and I finished my schooling. I trained as a teacher at Durham, and then I taught in Manchester for three years. Uh, Manchester at that time was pretty rough and I was in a very rough part but I loved it and uh, we had classes of 50 children the first day of teaching 55 year olds were mine alone but I loved it for various reasons I knew it was the right thing for me and I'd been well trained. So I carried on with that. My vision was for poor children uh, in the, the, perhaps in Africa, well, somewhere, I didn't know where, but poor children who needed education, like the ones that I was teaching here. And that began to think, I began to think about that. Where would I find these poor children who only have a little cloth round them, no clothes? And I began to read magazines of missionaries and to find out who had places where they brought these children into schools. And I found a mission. It was called at that time. Evangelical Fellowship. But the motto was, God first, go forward. I thought that sounds good. So I applied and I joined that mission. That actually was another step in a, a, a guidance that I had because I was reading the Bible way back when I was about 12, and I read the story of Abraham. Leave your country, leave your father's country, and I will show you where to go. Ah, I left Egypt, I left England, God showed me to come to Zambia, so that must be okay. And I just trusted God for that. And, uh, off, and I, I actually then went and two more years of theological training and then I went there. I arrived, they gave me a, a house of my own, mud brick, grass roof, yes, 
really suitable. And, and they gave, well, a friend of mine gave me a plaque to put on the wall. And it was, my grace is sufficient for you. I put it up there on the wall. How often I came back and looked at that. And I said, thank you, Lord. Your grace is enough for today. And I took that enabling of God day by day. Well, I was given three months to learn the language and then switch totally into Kikawande and teach uh, in, in Kikawande uh, uh, all, all subjects. I, of course, I had the girls' compound and that was my responsibility. And I hadn't been there very long when I knew that the area was under the whole power of spirits. In Africa at that time, and largely, the people were afraid of spirits. And they would invoke the spirits and they would do all manner of things under the power of the demons. Well, as I say, I'd been uh, there for a matter of months, and one night I heard this banging on my door. Vandona, Vandona, come and help. We're in trouble on the compound. So I put my Wellingtons on because of the snakes and went off to the compound to see what was happening. In front of me, you wouldn't believe it, there was a scene. The girls were cantering round as if they were horses. I heard the horses' hoofs. I smelled the smell of horses. And there was riot and trouble. I mean, all the girls were disturbed. Some were trying to stop, but most of them were involved. And there was, right in my face, a demonic scene, overt. I didn't know anything about the baptism of the Spirit at that time or anything like that, but I knew that Jesus was with me. So I, went, I stood and I lifted up my hand and I said, in the name of Jesus Christ, stop what you're doing. Stop and leave this compound. Leave us totally alone. You are not here. You are not supposed to come. This is God's place. Go away and leave us. And peace came back straight away. And I learned that the power of God in me, whatever I knew or didn't know, that the authority of God rested in me. Why? Only because I had given myself to God and said, you take me. And then I discovered all that happened after that. So I know there were a lot of other things. For example, God protected me when uh, I, I was responsible for a truck full, seven tons, of school equipment, a driver, an African driver, and me. And we loaded the truck, and as we came to go home, the road had become slippery. And the, luck, the truck slid this way, and that way, and this way, and that way, and then over it went. And we landed on our backs. I grabbed the driver, I thought he was going to run away. <laughs> I, I said, hey, you can't leave me. I'm only a Vandona. I'm only a woman. Don't leave me like this. And mercifully, he stayed. And oh, it was wonderful what happened. A truck full of men, soldiers they looked like, coming down the same hill. And then they stopped opposite. And one man stood up and he said, come on, you Zambians. These people have come to help us. 
Now it's our turn to help them. And they, start, they, they backed their truck so that their hook and chain were attached to the side of my truck, pulled it over. Do you want to know whether God takes care? Does he protect? Does he guide? Every moment of my day, I could tell you story after story. There's one more, I've got time for another. Uh, there's one more, and that's about a fire. Talk about precision. On that day, my friend, whose house, she was in charge of the medical, I was in charge of the school thing, her house was beside mine at an angle. But that day, that very day, she decided to decorate her bedroom. So she moved her bed into her guest house, which faced my house. And in the middle of the night, again, bang, bang, bang. Oh, Ruth, your house is on fire. Your house is on fire. Wake up, wake up. Both our houses are on fire. And I rather sleepily said, what, both of them? And it was so. It was the end of the dry season. We were hated, not because we were Christians, but because we were English, and Zambia wanted to have for themselves, out with the English, out with the British. So God wasn't about to let us go out. He kept us there because my friend Joan, she ran off into the compound and she said, come on, girls, come and help your Vandona. They need you to take things out of their house, it's burning. So we had about, I don't know, 10 to 15 minutes to grab as much as we could, and then the whole thing collapsed, both of them. But we were all right. Walked through the middle of it. You know, we just sang about um, the goodness of God, and he has kept me through the fire. And I sing that with gusto. He kept me through the fire. And we came out all right, praising God. I had no clothes at all. Yes. And <laughs> praise God. Praise God. Praise God. So many things. My grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. I was weak. He was strong. I couldn't have done those things. He did them for me and through me and with me. Last bit of Zambia. I'd been there six years, very happy, running the school. Many of the girls had become Christians. We had no more of that demonic stuff. After the first two or three years, no more. The girls became Christians. We sat round every evening, read the Bible, prayed, talked about God. And I was happy there. And then there came, a, again, knocks on my door. And this time, it was a delegation from my mission headquarters in, down in South Africa. We want you to take on running a secondary school at Mukingi, which is 100 miles away. I said, no, 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 that's not for me. I, it, go, go away, find somebody else. That's me talking to my mission leaders. No, God has put me here. Don't want to go anywhere else. OK, they went away. A few months later, came back again. We really want you to think about doing this secondary school. No, 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 I'm convinced I should stay here. Thank you very much. Away they went, but they came back the third time. And that time, I prayed. I said, Lord God, what do you want me to do? I expected him to say, go, or 
don't go. But that's not what God does. He said into my brain, but I want to go there. I want to be with those girls. I'm only asking you to come with me and be my hands and my voice. That's all. His power, perfect in my total weakness. Had two years. Connie came to help me. Together we got it going. <laughs> Bricks, mortar, roofs, uh, you know, the whole caboodle from the grass, literally the grass roots to a girl's second school to take ultimately three to four hundred boarders. And uh, oh my goodness, what a task. And in January 66, we opened the doors and Kingy Girls Secondary School started. It's still running today, known all over the uh, northwest of Zambia and even further as a good school to send your girls because there's a hospital around the corner, the teaching is very good, and they learn to serve God. So. That was all right, wasn't it? <laughs> it's still going today, I hear, now and again. Is that it? <laughs> no, that's very good, thank you. Oh, yeah, there's lots more, so I'm sure Ruth uh. will uh, be happy to talk to you afterwards. Um, in, in 1967, that was a very fruitful time for you in, in Zambia, wasn't it? But in, in 1967, uh, your father died. Yes. And so you were unexpectedly called back to the UK from Zambia yes. and uh, you looked after your mum because you love her and uh, loved her and, and to, to honour her. You've described those years to me previously as um, seven lean years uh, after you came back. Could you tell us a little bit about what impact that had on your faith and how it ultimately came to be that you joined the staff at All Nations Bible College? Yeah, um, it was a shock. It was the hardest thing I ever did to say goodbye to that school where my heart was, where my friends were, where everything I had thought to build in my life was there. And suddenly it was gone. And I came home. I loved my mum, yes. But how much did I love her? Yes, I loved her, obviously enough to leave everything else and to care for her. But what I didn't know <clears throat> was that God was actually taking me one step further on. And it was in those years, I, oh, I wept and wept and wept because uh, I just didn't want to leave Zambia and the school it was tough. What would I do in a little flat in Manchester? Yeah, I went back to teaching. Wasn't very joyful, believe me. The, uh, the ships full of uh, West Indians arrived and that's who I was teaching at that stage. And uh, <laughs> it was tough. So anyway, I did it, looked after my mum by this time, God had begun a new work in my life through reading a book called, by David Wilkerson, um, The Sword in the Switch, the, what's it called? The something in the switch, the cross, and, the cross and the switchblade. And uh, it was about these drug addicts. When they accepted Jesus, yeah, it was okay. But when they were filled with the Holy Spirit, whoa, it changed. And they, the drug addicts were saved and came to know him. And again, I thought, hmm, hmm. And I read the Bible like I hadn't read it in all those years. 
I read it, and I read it, and I read it, and I decided that all I had known before was not right. And here was the truth. Because I was taught and grew up thinking that the Holy Spirit was given to you when you were born again, and that was true, and I knew that was true, and that there was no more experience of the Holy Spirit. And if you think there is, it's demonic. Well, I knew the difference between what was demonic and what was actually uh, of God. So I, as I say, I searched the scripture. I, I talked to my colleagues, Americans, British. No, 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 nothing. No, don't go down that track. No, that's no good. But God was leading me. What could I do? Came back to England, as you know. By this time, I was in a turmoil. Was it right? Was it not? I wanted it. I knew it was right. And then in England, I discovered the Fountain Trust. Do you remember the Fountain Trust, some of you, if you're old enough? It was one of the new moves of the Holy Spirit, oh, a long time ago now. And uh, I went to, I took my poor mum with me because I couldn't leave her. So wherever I went, mum came too. And she was a bit mystified by it all. She would say, I don't know what's happening. There's, they're talking away in another language. And I, oh, and she would turn around and say, oh, would you shut up? I can't think. <laughs> and then she discovered that I would be doing that as well. And we talked, but she found it hard. Anyway, uh, that all, uh, that, was, that was a phase there, and it built me up. But I wasn't sure. And then a friend of mine came to stay, and we prayed together, and she prayed in tongues. And for the first time, I prayed in tongues. And after that, I was quite sure that the Holy Spirit had come in a new way into my life. So it was a bit of a muddle, but I got there eventually. And uh, I think, out of all that, well, I was working in my mission office. My mum went to stay in a home for elderlies in Reading. So we moved down, and I stayed in Wimbledon, where my mission headquarters was. And I worked there, and for four years, I lived in Wimbledon, and I visited my mum in Reading, and that was okay. But my mission was in a turmoil, and they were faced with, do we accept these people full of the Holy Spirit, or do we reject them? And this was going held my breath, but eventually, they said, you must sign this declaration to say there's nothing more about the Holy Spirit and you are not to use gifts of the Spirit in Africa. Ah, could I sign it? No, I couldn't sign that. Well, after a little while, I got faced with the whole mission council. Twelve men, all in suits, looking ever so smart. And I stood up and gave my defense why I believed in the fullness of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit. And you know what the end of that was? Okay, off you go. We don't want you anymore. So the day came when I was out of a job and they told me they don't want me anymore. I had worked faithfully for 17 years, done all that in Africa, etc. But no, because I wouldn't sign a paper, out I went. And I stood outside the door of the mission in the road and I said, 
God, it's you and me now only. My mum had died, my brother had gone to Australia, my closest friend from Zambia had died. I had nobody and nowhere to go. Did God leave us in a place like that? <clears throat> Not at all. In, a, in about three weeks, I got a letter from All Nations College. I was a former student. They wrote a, a routine letter, how are you? We want news of you, we pray for you, how are you? Oh, I, I, I just put it aside for a bit, and then I thought, they ask me how I am, I'll tell them. <laughs> so I did. I explained exactly what had happened, and came a, a letter back. Would you come for an interview? We would like to interview you for the staff of all nations. Oh, never thought about such a thing. It was far from my mind. I was going to go back and work in Woolworths or somewhere. And I went, and I had my interview, and that started the last 17 years of this long story. And there I was, teaching these students. My, my role was to take 12 every year. We all did that, all the tutors, and be a tutor. Mentor them, talk to them, listen to them, pray with them, guide them, help them, bless them. That was the main role. And then there were lectures. And eventually I lectured on spiritual warfare, spirituality, how to keep alive spiritually when you're in a dark place, uh, Bible meditation, worship, all those lovely things that I enjoyed doing, and I was able to teach them. And of course, all my experiences came useful because the students, some of them had had bad experiences of various kinds and are able to help them in the way that God had helped me. So I retired from all nations, and I came here. I came to sit and do nothing for a change. <laughs> <laughs> but it didn't happen. We had missionaries. Look at them, they're all around us. And I thought, there, yeah, this is a role for me. So I joined the mission uh, council, which had a member care. That was my heart, caring for poor old missionaries and their children, and praying for them, and keep on praying for them. And when we finish here this morning, I'm going to go to the uh, to to, um, to have a dinner with the uh, Williamson's family. And I think this as well, because I pray for them. And uh, that's my role from then till now. Amen. happening again, Ruth. So, Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So, can I just say that interviewing Ruth is the easiest thing to do in the world? <laughs> um, uh, she, she has finished she, she thinks but she hasn't really because there's another there's another question this is a this is a series um a part of a series so we had a real treat last week um from uh, gina reagan we've had another treat this morning it's not quite over yet um i thought i said that earlier that life is a marathon and, and not a sprint but it turns out that ruth this is a bit of a triathlon because 
Um, not only is it a marathon uh, and a sprint, it's also a relay. <laughs> So you're, you're, you're passing the baton on, uh, yeah. and I'd just like to ask you one more question. If there's anything, yeah. just if there's any one piece of advice uh, or, or, or thing that you'd like to pass on, what would that be? I think it would be, God is God, and let him be God of your life, your master as well as your saviour, and uh, your keeper, and all the things we've talked about. And he is your God forever and ever, and he will be yours right through eternity. And I think my advice would be, when if you've got young children, yes, and if you've got grandchildren, use the time when it's possible. Get the truth into their hearts so that they love Jesus. That would be one thing. For other people, God moves in different ways to guide us. And I don't know that I made that terribly clear, but reading the Bible, I read about Abraham, but that spoke to me. And there were, a lot, there were several times like that when I was led by that. I was also led by circumstances at the end, my dad died, and that was what finished my time in Zambia and brought me back and eventually to all nations. What was God doing? He was moving me on. So don't think that when he gives you one piece of guidance, that's not necessarily the whole lot. He's got something more for you at other times, however old it is likely. When my hair is grey, white, then that's all right. You go on. Uh, you, you just keep going on. Uh, and God is with you. And he will be with you. So I think, remember what God has said. And hide it in your heart. Don't let anybody take it from you. I, being me, I never told anybody I never told them that I felt led to this or led to that or led to the or not led as the case may be. It was hidden in my heart. Uh, well, other people are different and they're out with it all and that's another way of doing it. But um, to, to know every day that God has a purpose for your life. I have struggled when I retired and came here, all right, there were missionaries. And then I retired from missionaries. And I had my steady friend, Hillary, who has been with me through nearly all of this and knows it, she could give the story for me. And Hillary has been my absolute pillar because I have no family. And she has been my family. Uh, yeah. So she will answer any more questions. <laughs> so I think we're going we're gonna to wind up now. Are you going to do a... a so yeah, just before we do that, I've got your present. Um, uh, it's small. Uh, you might have one similar in your pocket. Uh, it's a two-pound coin. And on the outside of the two-pound coin, if you look very closely... It says, standing on the shoulders of giants. It's printed on every two-pound coin. So, to the marathon, the sprint, and the relay, we're going to add a bit of weightlifting. We've been standing on your shoulders. Thank you very much for everything you've said today. This is part of the series, Your Story, God's Glory, uh, and you've evidenced that to us today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. How are you? Hello. Oh, here's my Zambian <laughs> friend. <laughs> um, I would just like to say, the school Ruth started is still there, and my niece has just finished her nursing last year from Kinge Nursing yeah. School. Yeah. So congratulations for your foundation. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you.